Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the meeting of the Santa Barbara Independent Redistricting Commission for December the 2nd. Um, we will call the meeting to order at this moment, point. And uh, Ms. Tilton, if I could ask you to read the procedures. Today's meeting is remote, remote virtual only through the Zoom webinar information identified on the public agenda. The meeting is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the internet at www.countyofsb.org forward slash redistricting.sbc. Public participation during the meeting can only be done through the Zoom webinar link or by calling the phone number provided on the agenda. For those using the Zoom webinar link, please indicate that you wish to speak during public comment by selecting the raise your hand feature and staff will call, will, will know to call on you. When called upon, please state your name for the record. Attendees by phone can raise your hand by pressing star nine. When it's your turn to speak, we will announce you by caller ID or your phone number. When called upon, please state your name for the record. We reserve the right to mute a microphone for profane, harassing, or offensive language, or for speaking beyond the time limit set. The time limit for public comment is now set at three minutes. Recordings of the commission, me commission meetings, agendas, supplemental materials, and minutes of the commission are available on the internet at the same redistricting webpage cited earlier. That's www.countyofsb.org forward slash redistricting.sbc. Thank you. Um, so our agenda today is, has been published and is available uh, online. So we will proceed with that. Um, our primary um, objective today is, is to identify candidates who we will be inviting for interviews um, next scheduled for next week um, to join the commission. So before we begin uh, with the this deliberations by the commissioners, I'd like to open it up for public comment. If um, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Morris, for the record, we'll do a verbal roll call of all those present. Oh, you're we're correct. I skipped the roll call. My apologies. Okay, um, District One, Commissioner Katz. Present. District Two, Commissioner McClintock. Present. District Three, Commissioner Bradley. Present. District Four, Commissioner Gray. Present. And District Five, Commissioner Morris. Present. Okay, oh, yeah. thank, thank you for catching me on that. Um, so now we will open for public comment. Um, as Ms. Tilton indicated, if you are in, in, in the public audience and would like to make a comment, please use the raise the hand uh, feature or I believe it's star nine if you're on the telephone. And Ms. Tilton, would you um, introduce our first public comment? Okay. And I do have a request um, for Mayor of uh, Guadalupe, uh, Ariston uh, Julian. And I'm not sure that I see, that may be one of the phone calls, I'm not sure. Uh, Mayor Julian, if you'd like to go ahead and start by unmuting your. Um... Do we know if uh, Mayor Julian was calling by phone? We, I, I do not. Um, okay. And I don't see him on the attendee list yet, so he may not have um, checked in yet. Okay, we'll watch for him. I know that he had another meeting pending. And so as soon as he hops on, I'm gonna uh, try to move him to the next one. Um, let's, let's go with Sheldon Bosio. Hello, can you hear me? You can, yes. good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sheldon Bosio. I am the newly elected president of the Santa Barbara County Farm Bureau. And I would like to speak on item number five. Um, I've prepared a letter, and so if allowed, I will begin to read the letter. Okay, and Mr. Bosio, you could wait until item five, or you can speak now. It's, it's your choice. Um, um, if it's okay with you, I'll, I'll just speak now. Okay. 
And, and Mr. Bosu, just so you're aware, that letter uh, was received and was included in the agenda pack or was distributed um, to the commissioners, but please go ahead. Very good. Dear commissioners, I would like to start this letter by congratulating you as well as those remaining applicants who have qualified for the Santa Barbara County Independent Redistricting Commission. This is an extremely important process for the future of our county, and if executed and consistent with the guidelines set forth in Measure G, will ensure all residents, industries, and communities throughout our region to have the proper representation at the county level. The Santa Barbara County Farm Bureau provides a voice for more than 800 members countywide and works with local elected officials, county departments, and community leaders to develop policies and practices that benefit the agricultural industry as well as the region. We are the leader for the largest industry in the county, an industry that employs nearly 40,000 essential workers. Our local farmers and ranchers not only provide food for the members of our community, but also the residents all over the country and throughout the world. For this reason, we believe farmers and ranchers should have representation throughout the independent redistricting process. And there is only one applicant in the remaining pool who has the ability to do this. That is applicant Jennifer Hardin. Jennifer's family was one of the first to start farming in the Central Coast, and her knowledge of the region and perspective will be essential to making sure an industry that spans more than a century has a representation in this integral process. We are fully aware that there have been concerns about the current makeup of the commission, and we share those sentiments. Jennifer is a Latina, she is a farmer, and her knowledge of the county is second to none. She embodies a type of commissioner in which this independent process calls for. With this being said, the San Santa Barbara County Farm Bureau, our members and our industry urge you to select Jennifer Hardin as a member for this commission. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Um, I believe that Mayor, Har Mayor Julian, are you um, on the line? You can go ahead and begin speaking. Let's see if we can unmute you. Okay, there we go. Hello? Yes, we, we can hear you. Okay, great. So this is Felix Esparza. Okay. And you can hear me, correct? Yes, we can. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to speak uh, through technology now and during this meeting. Congratulations to the current commissioners and all of the remaining applicants. This is an extremely important process, and Lou, like Santa Maria, is very happy to see Santa Barbara County setting a precedent for other counties throughout the state one that encourages transparency and accountability throughout this process. My name is Felix Esparza. I am a member of LULAC, Santa Maria chapter, and I am a retired police officer as well from the city of Santa Maria, having served 25 years in the community and five elsewhere. LULAC, LULAC's main focus is on education, civil rights, health, and employment for Hispanics. And clearly the makeup of this independent redistricting commission and the final decisions made by its members will have an impact on the Central Coast Hispanics and Central Coast communities. With that being said, we want to highlight one community we feel is currently not being represented properly, and that community is Guadalupe, a heavily city, Hispanic city in the North County of Santa Barbara. It has very little in common in demographics, geography, and lifestyle compared to those cities such as Goleta and Solvang. For this reason, I believe and we believe as LULAC, it is imperative to have a voice on this independent commission from Guadalupe, someone who can provide perspective and ensure the residents of that community to have proper representation over the next decade. Once again, I thank you for your time and as an organization, LULAC strongly urges you to consider the city of Guadalupe in this selection process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Julian, are you 
on the line, I don't see. Um, let's let's go with um, Jeff Green. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. So uh, my name is uh, Jeff Green and I li live in Santa Maria. I am 27 years old and I think there should absolutely be some younger people selected to this independent commission. Uh, but there's one person in particular on this commission that I see as a problem and that's Janet Rios. She might be young, yes, but she also has some opinions and posts on social media that don't fit with the overall goal of this commission. If you're looking for someone younger, I encourage you to select Amanda Ochoa. Thank you and I hope I hope you take my words into consideration. Very good. Next. Melissa Smith. Thank you. I'll, I'll actually wait until item five comes up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Braden. Braden, our next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I would just like to make a general public comment. Uh, for the record, my name is Braden and I'm a resident of Santa Maria. Uh, I believe many of you have listed Janet Rios as a preferred candidate. I was under the impression that this is an apolitical body and here to improve Santa Barbara for all residents. I don't believe your mission would be possible with Janet Rios on this commission. Janet Rios voices her political opinions on social media and has aligned herself with a number of political organizations. Janet Rios would not be able to sit on this commission and make decisions without it being influenced by those political organizations which she has aligned herself with. I encourage you to take these comments into consideration when you make your vote. Thank you. The next speaker, Ariana Ossenmacher. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today and congratulations on being selected to the independent commission. I've been watching the last few meetings and paying attention to this process. I'm actually calling in today because I also have some current concerns about applicant Janet Rios. Like many speakers, I agree there needs to be more diversity when it comes to age, gender, and ethnicity in the commission, but I don't believe that Janet is that ap applicant. If you take a look at her social media page and the groups in which she's affiliated with, it's clear that she is a political and social activist. As commissioners, your mission of striving for diversity should not lead to divisiveness and impede the overall process that was approved by voters and set forth by Measure G. As a young independent person in this community, I'd much rather see Megan Turley selected. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Janet Levins. Hi, my name is Janet Levins. I live in Lompoc. I am extremely upset with no offense intended for any of the current commissioners. Um, I love old white men. I'm married to one. And he's great. However, I do not buy Joe Holland's explanation. After reading the first three pages and onto the fourth page of the measure itself, working to make this commission representative of the diversity of our county has been mentioned four times. So he really had to convince himself that old white men were what, what that meant. Um, it makes your job today and ongoing extremely important because now you have to bring the diversity that was written into the measure itself. 
and that Joe Holland ignored. So please, please. And I think based on the earlier comments this afternoon, it's also essential that people look at social media profiles before making their decisions. Thank you, and thank you for your work. It's going to be a long haul. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Next, we have um, Lawanda Lyons Pruitt. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I don't know if you remember, but my name is Lawanda Lyons Pruitt. I'm president of the Santa Maria Lompoc branch, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as NAACP. We are the oldest civil rights organization in the nation. And our goal is to make sure that we have a just society in which everyone is treated equally. That said, um, I wrote a letter to you on November 17th to express um, my disappointment with the diversity of the uh, commission. Thus far, nothing personal, but uh, just letting you know that it did not reflect the uh, community, the diversity of the community. Namely, uh, no African Americans, which make up 2% of the population, Native Americans, about 2% of the population, Asian Americans, about 6% of the population, uh, Hispanic Latinx, 46% of the population, and uh, females, 50% of the population, uh, when you only have one uh, female. So um, I appreciate the work that you all have done the past uh, week or so and applaud uh, what you've done today uh, to create your final list. Well, not your final list, but uh, your 12 pack or 14 pack or whatever it is. And with that said, we'll applaud the uh, strong support for applicants like Megan Purley, Ken Masuda, James Hurley, who would be that one African-American, uh, Lottie Murthy, the Asian-American, um, Jennifer Harden, Janet Rio. Then if we're talking females, uh, then you also have um, Kate Adams, Janice Keller. Um, that would make up the demographics and the uh, racial and ethnic makeup as well as age diversity uh, that we're looking for. Um, so we urge you to consider these candidates. I haven't looked at any social media pages. I don't have time to look at social media pages. I do know that uh, when you're talking about what interests uh, candidates have, that you need to take a look at Lupe Alvarez, He's the former mayor of Guadalupe. I do think that Guadalupe should be, a, be represented, but if he's the former mayor, um, he has too much vested interest, I believe. Um, lastly, we would urge you all to include public comments at the end of your interviews so that the public can comment on the interviews that they've watched. Thank you again for your time and commitment. Uh, and trying to create a commission that reflects the uh, diversity of the community. Thank you. Thank you. We have Gerardo Echeverria. Hi, how's it going guys? Good. Could you guys hear me well? We can. Hi, my name is uh, Gerardo Echeverria and I live in uh, Guadalupe. Um, I have lived here basically all my life and I work every day to support my family and my children, you know, just like everyone else. Um, calling to the, here to, today um, because clearly the makeup of this independent re, uh, redistricting commission and the final de decision made by its members will have a significant impact on, on my community, my family, 
and uh, Hispanics throughout the whole county. You know, I believe there, there's uh, one applicant that stands out uh, to me, as well as my friends and my family, and that applicant being uh, Lupe Alvarez. Um, Lupe, just as I was raised in Guadalupe, and, has, and he has experience as a former elected official. He's a proven leader and has the community's best interest in mind. Uh, once again, um, thank you for your time. Um, and I hope uh, you keep my family and my community of Guadalupe in mind when you make your final decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next uh, speaker is Janet Rios. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Janet Rios. Um, I am here to speak on item five, and I have written something. Um, so once more, um, thank you for having me and um, congratulations on your new roles. I'm excited to see how our communities shift in these next few months. And, um, you know, in my current role as a community college educator and a longtime resident of Santa Maria and the Santa Barbara County, I have seen the positive impact and result of having diverse representation at the table um, and that unique lens those folks bring because it allows them to immensely understand the experience of our communities of color. Um, from personal experience, our voices often have gone unheard. And that's not because we don't know how to speak up, but oftentimes we haven't had that opportunity to be at the table. And oftentimes we lack representation, representation that elevates our voices and our needs. Um, and as a community, you know, we all need to move forward and focus on improving the lives of all of our residents, um, regardless of political views, regardless of ethnic makeup, gender, you know, physical ability. We need to take into consideration all of that and how our decisions will impact their experience and realize that all of our lived experiences and our personal political views and all of that need to be put aside when making those decisions. And the decisions we make determine how those resources are you know, distributed. And with 46% of our Santa Barbara County community being Latinx, Hispanic, or people of color, I do find it very concerning that there are no people of color on this current mission currently. And today I just wanna ask as a board when going through the selection process that you use your positions of privilege and power to be proactive and intentional about who you select. It's important that we have folks that are empathetic to all regardless of whatever, you know, regardless of everything because everyone matters in our community, everyone. And it's important that we take into consideration everyone's needs. So I just want to emphasize the importance of including women of color in the conversation and acknowledge that there are a lot of us um, in the community that have the power to make change. And lastly, I just want to end by responding to the concerns of my social media post. Um, and I think it's very connected to my point about the importance of having younger members represented on the commission. I have voiced my opinions on social media outlets like many people my age. And for that to be held against me, um, it feels unfair and a huge reason why other people like myself often shy away from these opportunities. I believe that I have a lot to bring to the commission and I hope that I have a chance to prove it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Luis Gonzalez. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll have Luis go and then uh, Mayor Julian, we'll have you next. Hello? Yes. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Luis Gonzalez. I'm a resident of Guadalupe. I'm calling today to express to you guys that I feel like our community has a long history of being misrepresented. With that being said, I, as well as my friends and my family here in Guadalupe, believe Lupe Alvarez is the best applicant to be selected in the independent commission. We would appreciate having someone who cares and knows for our community and truly, truly does care. I really hope you consider the communities in Santa Barbara County and their best interests when selecting the applicants to the independent commission. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Next, we'll have uh, Mayor Julian. Are you able to unmute your microphone, Mayor Julian? Unmute. There Hello. you are. 
Okay, sorry about that. I just got on off another Zoom meeting and that was just as confusing. But uh, obviously I'm uh, I'm here in support of uh, Lupe Alvarez's position on the redistricting committee. I've been on the city council for uh, since 1980 and on and off. And uh, I had the privilege of, of serving with Lupe Alvarez and also working with him in a community in terms of his commitment to not only Guadalupe, but also of the Santa Barbara North County. And I think that what we see in Guadalupe is, and you know, some several individuals mentioned that there's a lack of, of connection uh, that we may have with the rest of the county. And that is, that is true. And I think that by having Mr. Alvarez as part of the committee and having some uh, presence from, the, from North County residents uh, that this would be an important role for him to play in that. And it would be important for Guadalupe. My recent uh, uh, meeting uh, on the Zoom was regarding our, our community in Guadalupe in terms of our, you know, the grand jury uh, four or five years ago said that we needed to disincorporate. Guadalupe is moving forward. And I think that Mr. Alvarez understands that serving with us on SBCAG as, uh, as a board member and also as a chairman, going to Washington DC to look at the levy project that along the Santa Maria levy and trying to expand that through, uh, you know, through, uh, through Guadalupe. It just indicates to, to, to me and to others that he's really committed about the, uh, serving the whole Santa Barbara County, especially Guadalupe, but North County and all Santa Barbara County. So I would, I would uh, uh, urge the, you know, the committee to appoint him as one of the members. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Fernando. Have you unmute your microphone? Yeah. There you go. Buenas tardes. Puedo yeah. tener yeah. un traductor? <clears throat> oh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Fernando Jiménez. Tengo 29 años y soy de Lompoc. Ya mero paso los nueve años de estar aquí cerca de mi familia de Guadalupe y de Santa María. De los aplicantes que están considerando para la Comisión Independiente del Condado de Santa Bárbara, mi familia de Guadalupe y yo estamos de acuerdo que hay un aplicante que en nuestra opinión no solamente es uno de los mejores aplicantes que están considerando para la posición, pero también es una persona que ha demostrado la lealtad a la comunidad de Guadalupe. Esa persona para nosotros es Lupe Álvarez. Su experiencia y le liderazgo lo convertirían en un activo para la comisión. Uh, Lupe será uno, una voz para una comunidad que ha, se ha pasado para alto en este condado durante demasiado tiempo. Pero muchas gracias y espero que consideren a Lupe. Gracias. Uh, Fernando spoke in support of Lupe Alvarez. Um, I, we don't have a translator and just reminder for the public, if you would like a translator, uh, the county needs to have um, 24 hour notice, but um, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to add to uh, the translation to, to help us with um, Fernando's testimony. Okay. This is Doug. I can just add a little bit. Uh, essentially, he said he's from Lompoc. He has family in Guadalupe. Um, and he feels that uh, Lupe Alvarez is one of the best applicants in the pool. And he speaks for, um, uh, Mr. Alvarez would speak for Guadalupe and for the whole community. Okay, thank you. The next speaker is Lily. Hello. We can hear you. Great. Um, I would like to deliver a comment um, really quickly. I just want to applaud the commission for the work that you have all done to demonstrate commitment to creating a final commission that will truly reflect the diversity of our county. Um, I personally reside in District 2, and I want to specifically applaud the strong support shown to applicants like Megan Turley, Ken Masuda, James Hudley, Lada Murti, Jennifer Hardin, and Janet Rios in the draft slates created by the current commission members. 
These applicants will create needed racial, ethnic, geographic, and age diversity, in addition to being qualified and committed to the redistricting, redistricting process. Um, it's unfortunate that there is a lack of diverse choices in the first district, although we do support the selection of a woman in this district and maybe a Republican woman like Cheryl Trotsky to ensure adequate Republican representation on the commission. Lastly, we would urge the commission to include public comment at the end of the commission interviews as well so that the public can comment on the interviews they watched. Thank you again so much for your time. That's all, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next um, speaker is Ken Howe or Huff. I'm, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Hello, I'm Ken Huff. Huff like in rough and tough. <laughs> thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Morris and commissioners and everybody. I'm Ken Huff and I'm staff for Santa Barbara County Action Network. For 19 years, SBCAN has been working to preserve our community's environmental and agricultural resources and to create sustainable communities. And to do these while promoting social and economic justice, we need diversity to thrive. When the members of our board of directors learned about the top 45 names uh, for the commission, they perceived a lack of diversity. And when your five names were drawn, and this is to take nothing, of course, away from your qualifications, the diversity concern was heightened, as I know it is for all of you. And now, having read all of the material provided with this agenda item, we, we applaud the strong support shown in your draft slates for applicants who are female, people of color, and young. You've taken the diversity challenge uh, that's presented by the random drawing to heart, it seems to me. These applicants will create needed racial, ethnic, geographic, and age diversity, and they all appear qualified and committed to the redistricting process. As some have said, it's unfortunate there's a lack of diverse choices in the first district, but you do have some female candidates and we support selection of a woman for that district. And finally, SBCAN asks, as others have, your commission to include public comment at the end of the interviews. So we'd be able to uh, comment on the interviews we've watched. Thank you very much for your service on the commission and for your consideration of our comments. And the next speaker, Anna, Anna Zepta. Anna? Hello, thank you for having me here today. So um, I just, my name is Ana Cepeda. I, I came here as a community member and I just wanted to voice my opinion that uh, and by applauding the commission for the work demonstrated to commit to create a final commission that will truly to reflect the diversity of our county. These applicants um, will create, will need to be create racial, ethnic, geographic, and age diversity in addition to being qualified and committed to the redistricting process. Uh, it, is, it is really important to focus on the need of the diversity. I was looking at the applicants and we definitely need more diversity in these um, situations. So maybe taking this as an opportunity to further uh, interview and further see the what it is the goals of each candidate is trying to portray into this commission. So allowing public comment at the end of the interviews when they are being watched. So that way we are able to really further elaborate and collaborate as a collective community into this decision that's going to occur. And I just wanna say thank you again for your time and your commitment in creating a representative um, commission. Thank you. Claire Weinman. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Claire Weinman. I'm the president of the Grower Shipper Association of Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties. Congratulations on your selection and thank you for your service in this important process. 
For those who might not be acquainted, the Grower Shipper Association represents over 170 growers, shippers, farm labor contractors, and supporting agribusinesses. Our members grow diverse field and nursery crops such as broccoli, strawberries, wine grapes, vegetable transplants, flowers, and tree fruit. Agriculture is a major stakeholder for both land use and also employment in Santa Barbara County. We encourage you to include agricultural representation in discretionary appointments being considered to complement the skills and experience in this important commission. Thank you for your work and your consideration of our comments. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Shatilo. Mark? There we go. Yeah, I think I'm there. Members of the commission, I'm Mark Chatillo. I'm a 30 year resident of Santa Barbara County and uh, I, I did vote for the measure and uh, I think it's, it's critically important. And I just wanna to speak to one issue um, that's before you other than to give my appreciation for the hard work that you guys are putting into it. And the issue I wanna to speak to is the importance of independence with respect to the individuals that um, you choose to, uh, to bring on and fill out the committee. Um, I think it was presumed when we all looked at the measure and voted for the measure that there would not be any elected officials or anybody that had served as an elected official because that would be contrary to the, to the spirit and the intention behind a truly independent redistricting committee. And so I, I think that's a particularly important factor that I wanted to share with you. Um, the, one of the, some of the language out of the ordinance is that the committee shall be independent from, in, from the influences of the Board of Supervisors, political parties, and campaign contributors. And when you have a candidate or a member of the committee that has been involved as a political official and has been elected or is serving as an elected individual. And, and there's uh, issues that overlap with SB CAG and the Air Pollution Control District where um, members are serving or have served with the boards of super, Board of Supervisors members. Um, they've been involved in conducting campaigns, uh, soliciting contributions and having that level of involvement in this political process that that is inconsistent with the independence that we in the community are looking to be the, the cornerstone of your committee's composition and, and the work that you undertake going forward. So I appreciate your consideration of this view and uh, I know that there's others that share it and I'd, I'd strongly encourage that um, as you make your selections, you ensure that that the committee and its membership are absolutely independent and free from any question with respect to past or present service. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, Hillary Blackerby. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, oh, that's, hi, yeah, there's obviously a, delay. Um, uh, I'm Hillary Blackerby here uh, as an individual and want to thank you for your service. I know it's a <laughs> difficult task. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to be in your position. Um, I appreciate the work you've done so far. It's clear based on your proposed slates that there's um, a lot of work to do with regards to diversity um, and diversity in all things many people have mentioned, but racial, ethnic, geographic, and age. Um, well, I'm disappointed with the, the lack of diverse pool to choose from. It seems like some of you have aimed for kind of the best you can do um, in your uh, proposed slate. I do think from a process perspective, the, you know, needing, I'm, I'm glad that the interviews will be public, but having public comment, as some have mentioned, after those, I think would be good. And the other thing that just sort of starkly came to light is it really is best practices for a public meeting right now, especially in this Zoom era, to have interpretation available um, on the 
on like the second or third page of the agenda in English, it says you can get accommodation for language access. Um, it's pretty easy to do over Zoom. A lot of the local agencies have figured out how to do it. So I'd recommend for future meetings that you have Spanish interpretation available um, so that more people can participate. Thanks. The next is Wendy Santa Maria. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Santa Maria. I'm here on behalf of COS, which is the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. Uh, we're a grassroots community organization that works to increase civic engagement amongst our local working class immigrant community and youth. And we've worked hard to bring community engagement to redistricting efforts across our region for over a decade, spanning from state assembly and Senate districts, county, city, and school boards. And it's incredible to see what valuable insight that our local residents have around natural communities of interest and maps that just make sense. Um, and I, I wanna raise the point that Santa Barbara County is 46% Latinx and the majority of, and majority people of color. And it is extremely concerning to see that so far we don't have a single person of color on the commission. We're in the midst of a national movement to reckon with our country's deep-seated racial injustice. And in order to fix something that's broken, you need the voices and lived experiences of people of color in the room. As a woman, I'm also disappointed to see that we only have one woman amongst the first five commissioners. It is a duty and obligation of um, you all as commissioners to remedy this problem. And it is critical that the remaining commissioners selected be majority women of color. As a young person, I also want to lift up that if possible, we should select commissioners who can represent a more diverse age range and help engage more young people in this process. And uh, looking at our current board of supervisors, it's apparent that there is a need to be proactive, to proactively make districts that are more representative of our communities of color. And you as a commission have Ms. Santa Maria, are you still on the line? It looks like we lost your audio for a moment there. If, if you get back on, if you could maybe just send a note through the chat to um, our uh, facilitators, we can try to bring you back in at a later point. I um, apologize for losing your audio there sometimes. Uh, the technology isn't our best friend. Um, Next is Spencer Brandt. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Hi, commissioners. Uh, my name is Spencer Brandt. Uh, I'm a resident of Isla Vista and I'm 24 years old. Uh, I just wanted to comment today uh, to uh, thank the commission for all the work you're doing. I'm, I imagine it's a difficult position to be placed in uh, given it's the very first time that we're seeing how this new process in democracy unfolds. So I thank you for your service. Um, I really wanna echo some of the comments that have been made today about how important it is that we have strong representation of uh, people of color uh, diversity in age. Uh, that's something that's really important to me as a young person. And that the applicants that you select uh, throughout this process should really be reflective of that. Um, and, and I think that um, uh, it, given the way that the first selection worked out, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about that. It's all the more important that we provide that balance uh, with the picks that you make here today. Um, and uh, from a procedural point, I also just want to say um, it probably would be a good idea to try and uh, maybe move the way that comments work towards uh, after the selections would have been taking place. Um, that way that it's <laughs> a little bit less uh, of what's happened here today, which is I think a lot of uh, proactive comments about how we would like to see things uh, instead of uh, more of a public feedback. Um, so thank you for your time and have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Any more, Ms. Tilton? Are there any more requests to speak? Please raise your hand. Uh, 
we saw a hand, uh, Shirley, uh, uh, can't tell if your hand is raised. Would you like to speak? Their area code uh, 415-299. Okay, um, and we have Gail Teton Landis. Can I go ahead? Yes. yes Hi, my name is Gail Teton Landis and I wanna thank the commission uh, for the work that you're doing. And I believe you will do your best to create a diverse commission regarding sex ethnicity, geograph geographic location, and age. Regarding that, I applaud the, um, the strong support that I saw in some of the slates that you worked up um, for applicants like Megan Turley and Ken Masuda, James Hudley, uh, Lada Murti, Jennifer Harden, and Janet Rios. But I have to say, I'm a bit concerned about folks who are under consideration who have served as elected officials. I think they have potentially hardened or entrenched points of view, which will not help them or you in this process, which to be, needs to be as open and flexible um, as, as possible. I also heard others recommend that public comment be allowed at the end of the commission interviews as well, so the public can comment on those interviews that they've watched, and I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any others uh, desiring to speak? If you could please raise your hand. Okay, Shirley, I see your hand is raised. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm new to this stuff, so I punched the wrong buttons. Um, <laughs> I'm speaking in, in support of Lupe Alvarez. Uh, in my 20 years here in Guadalupe, he has been a, a stalwart supporter of everything uh, he knows the fields. He started out early working in the fields and uh, has grown up to be quite an entrepreneur. He knows the valley, knows the people, knows how to work with people. Uh, he Even because the cemetery here has no backhoe, he digs the graves. So uh, you don't have many people who will give of themselves doing that type of work. I would support him very much for this position. Thank you all for what you are doing. Thank you. And Leilani Rubenstein. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Leilani Rubenstein. Um, first, I'd like to thank the commission for um, all the work we've done in creating slates um, that would attempt to uh, represent a uh, commission that is um, representative of the final diversity of our county. Um, today, I'd like to urge the commission to allow public comment at the end of interviews. Um, as uh, previous commenters have stated, uh, there's kind of a problem where we're advocating for specific people, but nevertheless, I do want to emphasize the importance of having UCSB's voice being represented. James Hudley um, currently is a member of um, the UCSB University Center Governing Board, and is also representative of the um, racial diversity of our county as he is black. And um, I just really would like to um, emphasize the need for the board to take into consideration UCSB's outsized impact on the county. Thank you so much. <coughs> Sorry Thank about you. that, I'm a little coffee today. <laughs> Thank you. Next is Eloisa Chavez. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much to the commission for having everyone on. Um, and I just wanted to echo a few of the items that have already been said um, in regards to including and uh, prioritizing demographic, uh, gender and ethnic backgrounds, um, especially uh, as far as um, age and uh, just making sure that everybody is being represented as much as possible. Um, we have a very large agricultural community, especially uh, in Northern County. And I feel that that's something that really needs to be taken into account. 
Um, and another thing is that I would also like to echo the need for interpreters. Um, I feel as though this is something that should have been uh, just uh, already taken into account in advance and would be necessary in order to get or gauge uh, our community. And I think that unless there is somebody on the commission who can actually speak the language of the community, um, this commission needs to prioritize that they were able to understand what the needs are, regardless of what language they're being um, just sort of given that information. And uh, I hope that we sort of move that forward. And that is one of the priorities of the commission. Um, again, thank you so much for um, your time. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. I am not seeing any hands raised. Is there anyone else re uh, wanting to speak during the public comment portion? And Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Chair, I do have some public comments that were submitted in writing that I'd like to um, submit for the record. Um, as you mentioned, the Santa Barbara County Farm Bureau sent a, a email in support of applicant Jennifer Harden. Jeff Havlick requested Isla Vista be separated from Santa Ynez. Uh, Julie Hayward Biggs, past city attorney for Goleta, recommended NDC for redistricting services. Econ Alliance Board of Directors um, so spoke in supporting demographic, geographic, and background diversity for the commission with political affiliation secondary. Pam Gates uh, supported demographic diversity for the commission. Kendall Jackson, I have that name right, I'm sorry, uh, supporting demographic, geographic, and political diversity for the commission. And then, uh, and that's, those were all the comments that were submitted by 5 p.m. Um, we did receive a letter from Mayor Guadalupe. It was after the 5 p.m. Um, I will forward that to you as well. And we received uh, a, another email as well from Elizabeth Sign that I will forward to you um, in support of the diverse commission. Very well, thank you. So we will close the um, general public comment at this point. And uh, Chair, uh, Chair Morris, there's been a request for a bio break from um, one of the panelists um, soon. So yeah, so we're going to knock out items three and four quickly, and then we will take care of that. Okay. Uh, so with that, um, item number three, Commissioner Disclosure of Ex Parte Communications. Um, Let's just rotate through this uh, quickly. Commissioner Katz, anything to report? No. Mr. McClintock? No. Mr. Bradley? No. And Commissioner Gray? Yep. Uh, the only thing I would report is that uh, Ms. Tilton and I had a phone conversation earlier today to talk about procedures for um, trying to help facilitate our conversations later this afternoon. Uh, item number four, approval of the minutes of our November 18th meeting. Could I have a motion um, or are there a, um, amendments to be made? I motion to approve minutes as submitted. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. McClintock seconds. Uh, Ms. Tilton, would you call the roll? District one, Commissioner Katz. Aye. District two, Commissioner McClintock. Aye. District three, Commissioner Bradley. Yes, to approve. District four, Commissioner Gray. Approve. And district five, Commissioner Morris. Yes. That's a 5 0. Very well. Um, so, as requested, we are going to take a um, comfort break for a moment. Um, let's take five minutes. I have 425 on my clock. We will reconvene at 430. All right.
right, I think I see all of the commissioners back in place. Uh, we will reconvene our meeting this afternoon. Our next item is um, item five, discussion, deliberation, and possible action regarding the selection of commission finalists to be interviewed. Um, we'll reopen public comments specific to this item because I think a few folks uh, indicated they were going to wait to make their comments around the time of this item. Um, for the members of the public, again, I would invite uh, anyone who has a comment about um, item five, who has not already submitted those comments earlier, uh, to raise your hand and Ms. Tilton will uh, facilitate um, adding your comments to the record. Lee Heller. Yes, uh, Chair and Commissioners, I assume you can hear me, but if you Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, I'll try to be fast because I have a lot of ground to cover and I know I don't have a lot of time. Thank you so much for taking diversity seriously. That's clear from the slates you put together. I'm going to try to run through some responses quickly. Uh, looking at the chart, it looks to me like someone like Lata Murti in District 4 seems like a logical choice. Ditto for Janet Rios. I'm puzzled by these vague uh, critiques of her by some of the people who called in during general public comment. I don't see anything in her social media that would indicate a concern. Um, and she has the kind of diversity, Latinx background, et cetera, that we're looking for. Um, so those two seem to me like you would definitely want to interview them and prioritize them high. Uh, then going district by district. District one is tough. Um, because we are still trying to find diversity and that's not easy in district one. I know that Daniel Montello looks good on paper, but there is a concern about the fact that his former student and co-author is an employee of NDC. So this is the question of a potential conflict of interests, especially if you do decide to consider an alternative to NDC. Um, I noticed that one of the public comments that was sent in about Gerald Trotsky involved her attitude around COVID-19 restrictions. So I read that letter. And if you're looking for a commissioner who's gonna use science and accurate data to make decisions, then she's not it. Because the claims in her letter about Sweden being a model have been long disproven. So maybe Claudia Knudsen for district one, she is other party preference, which is important because we're looking for party variety. And she has a breadth of background in her application. Um, I have a little bit of a concern about Karen Twible because she talks a lot about her policy views and the point of this commission is not policy, but redistricting independent of policy preferences. District two is a dilemma. You have two really strong people, young Megan Turley um, and Ken Masuda, who is highly qualified. He would bring the party diversity as a Republican, but I would encourage you to interview both of them. Uh, District 3, James Hudley, as far as I know, is the only African-American candidate from this larger pool, and we need that diversity. Um, I heard the calls in favor of Lupe Alvarez. I really share a strong concern about a former elected official serving, especially someone who is mayor, who might have a hard time just being a team player. Can he subordinate his own opinions, particularly on past redistricting, and just settle down to the work? We do need Hispanic representation, but that can be accomplished with other members. And also if we have geographical diversity within the county's largest district, James Hudley would accomplish that. Um, so I was thinking about that as well. And in terms of at large, uh, Jennifer Harden would also bring Republican and geographic diversity. Obviously has the strong support of the agricultural community. So I will leave it at that. I'm hoping that you're going to interview those people and probably a few others. I will also say that regarding taking public comment after interviews, I had assumed that would be the case, but from the general public comment, I think I should also express my support of that just in case it isn't already in the plans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Melissa Smith. This is for item five. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Melissa Smith. Uh, family medicine physician and director of health equity initiatives at UC Santa Barbara, and was the founding coordinator of the Latinx and Indigenous Migrant COVID-19 Response Task Force. Thanks so much to all of you for your effort going through so many applications with such care and forethought, 
and for incorporating and emphasizing diversity as much as possible into your slates of potential commissioners, since this is mandated by the ballot initiative that established the Independent Redistricting Commission. I'd like to affirm my support for Megan Turley from the second district and Lata Murthy from the fourth district, as well as Janet Rios from the fifth district. These are applicants who bring expertise and diverse background, as well as representing populations that are underrepresented, but needed to be included. James Hudley from the third district would provide geographic diversity with the district since he is from the Southern part and would provide balance with Commissioner Bradley. Since party registration demographics need to be reflected in the makeup of the commissioners as well, I would encourage you to consider Ken Masuda from the first district at, at, for the at-large position. Mr. Masuda is Asian and highly experienced and knowledgeable about county matters, <clears throat> given that he was the assistant CEO and budget director for the county. I acknowledge that it seems strange not to be advocating for Lupe Alvarez from the third district since he is Latinx but it is important to consider other issues beyond demographics. I'm concerned, and that certainly has been echoed by a number of people today, as that as former mayor of Guadalupe, Mr. Alvarez might be too invested in particular outcomes and lack the independence that is supposed to be at the heart of the commission. The Latinx and indigenous migrant task force is built on the same principles that the commission is meant to be driven by, collaboration, equal participation and collegiality. I'd like to ask you to consider whether a former mayor can play such a critically important neutral role in these efforts, especially on an issue involving elections and politics. And just to echo what others have said, I'd also like to ask you to take public comments after the interviews and certainly think that providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, at least in Spanish, is very important to foster the inclusive spirit that you all are aspiring to promote. So thank you again for your very important work and your consideration. Are there any other requests to speak on this item five? Oh, I'm sorry, um, Lupe Alvarez. You can uh, unmute your mic, there you go. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Can yes. Hear me? Okay, I, um, I thank the commission for giving me a chance to speak and uh, I don't wanna speak um, about myself at this time. Other, I just wanna clarify that I can be very impartial um, and I'll give you one example. I was selected for jury duty about eight years ago. Unfortunately, it was a child molestation case and uh, it was a very difficult uh, case. I tried to not be picked as many of us do due to work commitments and whatnot. And I, when the judge asked, is there a reason why anybody should be excused? I raised up my hand, your honor. Um, you and I barbecued this weekend for, uh, for a community event. He goes, okay, did we speak about anything bad? Anything political, anything about my cases? No. Okay, well then sit down. Then the district attorney started speaking about, well, I should have been answered to my IT guy because um, I'm having trouble with my computer right now. Well, I raised up my hand again. Your honor, um, my cousin is IT for the district attorney and um, just wanted you to know that uh, just you know, for information. He says, okay. How often do you talk about any cases he's working on? But well, I don't. Okay, sit down. All right. So then one more thing. Um, he says, is there anybody here that knows anybody else on the jury pool? I go, Your Honor, uh, jury member number three lives eight, eight doors away from me. He says, okay. And is there a reason why that would be a problem? No. Then please sit down. One last thing, I said, Your Honor, I'm also the mayor of Guadalupe. And this is where he got me. And he said, okay, Mr. Alvarez, when you have a, a hearing before you at the city council chambers, do you make up, up your, make up your mind before you have all the evidence, before you hear all the information, or do you wait to hear what the information is and then you make up your mind? I go, Your Honor, 
I have to listen to all the facts. I have to listen to all the information. And he said, okay, please sit down. I stayed on the jury. We convicted the gentleman. He got like 162 years. And that's all I'm going to say. I hope um, I'm part of this commission in the end, but I leave that up to you. And I, I believe that uh, it's one of the hardest jobs you probably will ever do in your lives, but I can be fair, balanced, and impartial. Thank you. We have uh, Gail Teton Landis. Hi, um, this is Gail Teton Landis again. I just was looking at the di different um, districts and some of the recommendations that all of you had made in your slates. And I just uh, wanted to sort of reaffirm some of the, the, the folks that I, I think you'll be interviewing and I would encourage you to interview. I'm looking at um, Claudia Knutsom in District 1, both Ken Masuda and Megan Turley in um, District 2. I, I, they're very different. Um, who knows, maybe one of them would end up as a, um, in the at-large position. Um, I'm really appreciating James Hudley, and I think you've all noticed, and it's been said before, um, he's from the southern part of the district, and he's, I think, the only black person in the in the whole pool. Uh, district four, Lottie Murti, um, has gotten a lot of uh, rec recognition, I think, from the slates you've you've made, and in in um, I'm looking at um, Jennifer Hardin from District 4 and Janet Rios, again, from District 5. I think all of those people should be under consideration. Thank you. Do we have any others requesting to speak on item five? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't see any requests to speak. Well We'll close public comment on this item and bring it back. Um, is there any staff report or any any um, anything the staff wants to kind of lay on the table before we over, go to the commissioners for some discussion about how we proceed? Mr. Johnson? Yes, uh, good evening and, and my appreciation to all the residents who have shared their thoughts. Um, just a couple of, of points I, I suspect most of the people that commented have already noticed this, I, and the commission probably has as well. But it is worth noting that as you go through these choices, looking at the different demographics, the, the current commissioners are limited by who's in the pool. And so when we talk about uh, Hispanic Latino members, of course, unfortunately, there are no Hispanic Latino members in the District 1 or District 2 pools. So the most you could possibly have would be four one from each of the other three districts plus an at-large member. But as was just mentioned, and a, a couple of the other commenters pointed out too, the only African-American uh, member of the pool is from District 3. So you could either, if you were to max out on those issues, you could either have four Latinos or three Latinos and one African-American would be the most you can get. Um, similarly, on um, the, the gender front, um, we have district three where there are no women in the pool um just male and one declining to state so there these are the challenges and i want to uh highlight them just so the public is aware of these issues and wonders why don't we have five latinos well mathematically given the pool you have before you and that's all you're allowed to work with it's impossible so just wanted to lay those facts out and then of course we're happy to to assist as you go through this process um, Shalise, and I did look at one thing and we're throwing out there as an idea if you wish to follow it up, which is if you look at everyone who got two, at least two vote, at least two votes in the first slate to the degree we could interpret uh, your input as being in a given slate. If you look at people who got at least two votes to be in a first slate or a one vote to be in a first slate and two votes to be in the second slate, that actually gets you to 12 people. So um, it's still not perfect. For example, there's only one person in that pool from District 1. But if you're looking for 
and find yourself needing a starting point, that might be where you start from and then change it as you wish. But uh, happy to assist however is uh, useful to you. Very well. Um, commissioners, I'm going to open it up for, for um, some discussion at this point. If there's somebody that wants to maybe suggest a starting point or wants to advocate strongly for a, um, a particular slate as a point of departure, um, now might be your chance. Commissioner Katz, you're on mute, ma'am. I think um, when I was looking at all of our slates, I did notice, and I think um, Mr. Johnson brought this up, that some slates showed someone being in the first choice and the second choice, and in other cases, there was no one. And I, I'm a little confused about how it, I don't know if that means it's kind of top heavy when you have someone in slate, the A slate, and then that same person in the B slate and so on, and then no one in another slate. It, it, I, it was my understanding, and I'm, I'm not gonna stick to this if we don't need to, that we needed to pick 18 candidates and, and at large. And somehow that doesn't come out. That's all. Oh, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Yes, sir. Um, one thing that public should be aware is that in the agenda packets are both NDC's summary of your selections and the actual messages we got from each commissioner. Uh, one of the things we ran into is we were thinking we were gonna get five lists of three slates. And as people can see, that is not at all what we got. So um, in the three hours we had to put a summary together before it needed to be posted, we did our best. Um, so yes, I, I think different commissioners took different approaches, which is fine, but it does lead to some confusion. Um, but yes, yeah, some people did have, for example, the same person from district two in all three slates. So that's why the, the numbers show up the way they are. And I, I, I don't know that uh, we can really resolve that other than to jump right into who you think should be in the 12. Right. Okay. But yeah, who's next? Why don't we, why don't we do this? Uh, Ms. Tilty, could you bring up that spreadsheet? Um, that has the um, your the summary data, and, and we'll share that on the screen as a reference point for everyone. All right, is that showing for everyone? It is. Yeah. Um, okay. So, commissioners, I you know just as a as a place of departure. Um, you know, staff have indicated that they figured out a, a way just on numerics to get us to 12. Um, I, I would tell you, I did a similar back of the envelope look and, and, and you know, um, in the procedure document that Commissioner Bradley and Commissioner Katz in the, uh, to, um, put together, um, there was some discussion, there was a mention of, you know, needing at least three votes to move forward, right? Um, and, and so what I did is I looked at you know, who got at least three mentions in any slate. Um, so, you know, for instance, in District 1, um, you know, Daniel Montello has three references, right? So as an example. So if, as I look through that, that got me to 15. Um, but similar problem to what uh, Mr. Johnson mentioned, it only left me with one candidate in District 1. And I'm not sure I think on the first round through, we want to get to one commit, you know, one candidate in any district, right? So then you look at, you know, who's that the next? And I, you know, I note that um, uh, Karen Twible has two number one votes, so maybe that's the second. So anyway, that so that got me to sixteen. Um, that's somewhat less than twenty-seven or thirty-seven or however many we're starting with. Um, I don't know. Does anybody have a preference on how we begin to 
maybe we could start initially by just hiding the rows of individuals that have no mentions. That would narrow it a little bit. Um, but any any other kind of thoughts of, from a procedural? Let's let's have her do that real quick. Commissioner Bradley, while she's kind of cleaning up a little, what's your thought? <laughs> um, I think if we're going for the goal of having two from each district, uh, there are some, it seemed actually, I was very pleasantly surprised to see that we converged fairly well on a number of people who, uh, you know, I, I'm looking here, for example, at Megan Turley in District 2, uh, James Hudley in District 3. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if we shouldn't just go ahead and uh, put those individuals on our list right away. Let's go ahead and, you know, those that we've converged on fairly well, uh, go ahead and select them for now. I mean, we can take a vote on a final selection toward the end, but just uh, for the sake of trying to focus in on those that we are going to need to deliberate more closely upon, uh, I would say go ahead and those who have at least three number one choice votes, set them aside already because I think they have, you know, that was kind of the process we wrote up was to give them that, um, I won't say automatic selection, but certainly preferred selection. Certainly that would be the threshold ultimately, right? That, that yes. we'll need to, so uh, Ms. Tilton, can you do this? Can you highlight the candidates who have three first round ballots? Uh, maybe just put a big bright yellow, you know, highlight over their names. Get, get your yellow here. Have I missed any? Yeah, it looks uh, like we didn't take on Jennifer Harden. Hmm. Anybody else we've missed there, folks, as you look at that real quick? So that would give us, um, so we have no candidates at the moment in District 1. We would have one in Districts 2 and 3, two in District 4, and one in 5. So, um, Oh, Commissioner Katz, maybe you want to start us off with a conversation around District 1, and, and let's mm -hmm. let's focus there for a moment. Again, this isn't our final listing, but it, it, it's a place to get a, a starting set, right? Um, I'm going to have to look at some notes because I'm swimming in information. Right. But I really, you know, I know that my, my first candidate, uh, Claudia Knudsen, I thought she was remarkably qualified. She's uh, not old like I am. Um, she does not have a party preference. And uh, she has a, an excellent background. And because I was limited by, you know, I'll just say, I, I don't mean limited, but this is, this is who we, a fabulous group, but, um, I just really felt very strongly about her, although I seem to be the only one that selected her. And um, I am also concerned about the information that we have learned about Cheryl Trotsky and her position about being a kind of an anti-masker. So, and I don't know how else to put it, but I don't think that that backs science. And we have a community of people that are vulnerable. And to have that attitude is of concern to me. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a, a case to make in District 1? Well, I guess um, my feeling is if we're, if we're trying to select candidates that had the highest scoring, um, we choose those that ha have maybe two that have either ones, twos, or maybe threes um, in district one. 
And uh, just looking at it the way it is now, that seems to me to be, um, boy, there's three, Elizabeth Kramer, um, uh, Dan Montello, and uh, Claudia Knudsen. Um, uh, well, Karen, so Karen Twybel has two first round, or first ballot, first slate, however you want to define this. There's two number ones in her column. Um, and uh, I think okay. the only one that does. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm, I wasn't looking, I was looking just above uh, line 11, so I didn't. Yeah. Yep. Um, So can we can we put her on as a tentative for the moment and Twible? Yes. That makes sense to me. Okay. Then the second one becomes a little more interesting, right? You go is are you know, is a one and a two a higher score than two twos and a three? Or yeah. <laughs> who's our math whiz here? Run some. <clears throat> Chair Morris, this is Steve Churchill, obviously. I sure. think what you could do simply is give one point for um, in category A, maybe a half a point in category B, and a third, a point three in category three and C. That, that way you could weight it. Um, so someone that got two ones like Ms. Twybell would be, that's two points plus a half a point in category B, um, two and a half points. I mean, that's just one way I would, you, one way you could weigh it. Okay. Uh, so, you know, commissioners, for me, as I look at this, just from a kind of a vote weight, you, you know, the, the, the two that I look at are right now, are Claudia Knudsen and, and you know, Daniel Montello. I, you know, with a nod toward some gender balance, I might put a thumb on Claudia, but I, you know, I don't know that I think, I don't have a super strong feeling about that one. I'm just looking for a way to, to, to maybe split hairs here at this point, but. Mr. Bradley. I think um, we've heard quite a bit of public input today on Claudia Knudsen. Uh, a lot of people seem to like her and think that she would be a good pick. Uh, I think we should certainly take into account the public comment that we've had on some of the candidates. Excellent point. Uh, so would you recommend we tag her at the, at the moment on our working list? I do, yes. Okay. So let's see if we can get at least two in each and then we'll come back and figure out who the wild cards might be. Um, so district two, we currently have Megan Turley, um, you know, the, the next, if we're using kind of our weighted scoring, it looks like it might be Ken Masuda. Again, we heard some positive co public comments around Mr. Masuda. Um, I don't recall any of the other names being brought up, but I might've missed it in the public comment. Anybody else have a strong preference I would support Ken Masuda as well. Me too. Okay. Hi. Uh, District three, we have uh, Mr. Hudley uh, at the moment. We, and that's the only one, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I take the public comment that, that we've heard. Um, and it was really both sided around Mr. Lou Alvarez. Um, I, I, I am persuaded to some degree personally um, by the, the lack of inv involvement that the city of Guadalupe has had, you know, in the county for, for a long time. And, and for me, that, that seems like an opportunity for us to 
acknowledge um, that that's a distinct community that, um, it, you know. So anyway, I, I would I would argue that I think there's a case to be made uh, for the, for Mr. Alvarez as a representative of Guadalupe. Um, but I'm open to other suggestions if others want to nominate somebody else in in the third district. Um, I'd like to speak on that, please. please. I, uh, Lupe Alvarez was my number one pick for D3 at the, at, in the beginning of the process, but I've also had concerns about the fact of his prior service as mayor of Guadalupe. I know last week we had some discussions about trying to avoid uh, too much concentrated interest in particular townships and cities represent, represented too much overemphasis. I know, of course, also, though, on the other hand, we've heard a lot of public comment about how important it is to represent Guadalupe. Guadalupe is one of the fastest growing areas of our county. And uh, certainly, we need to hear voice, we need to hear voices from that part of our county. Um, but I do have some concerns about perceived conflicts of interest and in just his, his, his background. He's certainly a highly experienced individual. But um, I think for District 3, besides uh, James Hudley, who I think we've converged on very quickly as an excellent candidate, um, I have very positive feelings about Benjamin Almeida. I think he'd be an outstanding candidate. I'm extremely impressed with his, his record, his public service. Uh, he also has been very intimately involved with the Native American community. I think he can give them excellent representation on our commission. So uh, I would like to make a plug for uh, Benjamin Almeida uh, as also a, a Latinx and also with his extensive experience in healthcare and working with Native American community. I'd support that. I would third that. Mr. Katz, do you have a preference uh, between those? Well, I am also concerned about uh, Mr. Alvarez and a conflict of interest. And I am very sympathetic to needing representation in, in Guadalupe. But I also feel, I, I, I feel like my hands are tied. And so I'm, I feel good about Mr. Almeida. Okay. Uh, we have two candidates tagged at the moment for District 4. So let's come back to that one when we talk about um, some wild cards. And let's, let's look at District 5. Um, any strong um, preferences here? I had I had Janet down for each of my slates. I think we need someone young to be able to represent that uh, demographics. I hadn't heard anything about social um, communications. Okay. Anybody else have a? I think everybody had everybody but I had her as their number one. Um, um, I, I indicate, I tagged Kevin, um, I, I'm probably not pronouncing this correctly, but ILAC, um, uh, primarily because he's one of only two Asian um, candidates in the pool. Um, and, uh, you know, anyway, I thought that that was a, a you know, a, an important voice as well. I have him on my slate for my C slate. No. no, my B slate, excuse me. On the B, um, The other name that seems to have gotten multiple mentions on this one is Tom Martinez. Um, a couple of different people's, not, not the A slates, but on you know, a number of slates. Anybody have a strong feeling about Mr. Martinez uh, versus Mr. Villa? Bradley, I'd like to, I'd like to focus again on on Mr. Eilick. I think he looks like a, an excellent candidate. He's a very, <clears throat> from what I could determine in my review of the internet, he's a very celebrated teacher, 
in Santa Maria. Uh, it certainly has an, an outstanding, probably better than any of us, understanding of civics. And um, <clears throat> I think he also would do an excellent job of representing a lot of our youth in our county, since he does work with students on a, on a regular basis and has for quite a long time. Uh, I think he would be an excellent choice for District 5. Mm -hmm. I'd support that. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and tag him. So that would give us 10. Um, we had talked about bringing back as many as 12. So now looking at the full list, anybody have a, uh, a candidate you really want to make sure we get on the list? Mr. McClintock. Uh, you know, I, I heard the public comment about um, Dan Montello and how his graduate student is employed uh, to work with this, this commission. Um, but I, I think that he has very, very deep knowledge of uh, redistricting and gerrymandering. He's written a lot about it. He's got experience um, on uh, multiple committees and departments as chair. He's, he, uh, he's a, clearly a... Uh, good communicator and, and um, collaborator. So I would advocate to have uh, include Dan in, in our, uh, our um, deliberations. I'll second that too. Okay, let's- um, I will as well. Yeah, then uh, another public comment was I'm concerned for uh, UCSD representation. Obviously he's not a student, he's a professor there, but he's got experience with students. Okay, maybe pick a color other than you. Yeah, go ahead and color him in for a moment. Uh, I, I would like to add uh, Amanda Ochoa. We had some votes for her. Amanda Ochoa, okay. Mm -hmm. Number 34. Wait, wait, wait. I'd second that too. And she represents, represents the 30 to 40 age group too, which is really needed. Okay. Joe and who else was this? Is there anybody else that you know? I don't, I don't think we have to stop at this point. We we, we can still. If there are other names we want to consider. Um, now's the time to bring them forward. Um, so maybe take just a minute to kind of process that <laughs> uh, color chart there. And Lata Murti is also being considered for district. Four, correct? Correct. Yes, she's on our oh, list. There's yellow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What was the difference between the yellow and the um, pink? Uh, the the, the, the pink were kind of our wild card that we're working through right now. That's the only. I'm having problems. I'm on the phone now because my my computer is not working. I uh, I still didn't hear your answer about the yellows and then the other t two that are color different. Uh, yeah. So Commissioner Gray, the 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 two that are colored differently are the ones we're talking about right now. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. No. No. I'm ranking trying to catch all. catch up with you. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I would like to point out something that's probably obvious to everybody that <clears throat> of, the, of, of all 12 people, if we were to select them for interviewing, I think we have answered very well to the need for diversity uh, of, of gender and race. Um, I think this is an excellent interview slate to put forward. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the bases that we were hoping to cover. And uh, I, it's not perfect, of course, but Given, as you said, uh, Chair Morris, I think that, uh, you know, given what we started with initially, I think this is pretty good. I think we've done an excellent job of narrowing this down uh, to some candidates who are supremely qualified to serve on the commission 
and would represent our county equitably and fairly. I second that. So I think we may have a list. I, are we set on 12? Is, is, is there anybody that would like to expand or change that number in any way? Have we identified an at-large candidate yet? Or would we select from this pool an at-large? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, Commissioner Katz, the idea would be that among these 12, we'd get to the six, right? So there, there's okay. enough in each district that any of them could end up being that okay. at-large. There's at least two from each of the districts. Looks like one has three, but every every district has at least two people to pick from. Right. Um, Given the fact that we have two or three representatives from each district, what that means is that during the final selection vote, um, <clears throat> if we were to take the 12 people we have here as our interviewees, uh, just systematically speaking, it would just be a matter of picking the best of one or two uh, of candidates from each district, which does somewhat simplify the process. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's going to be some hard choices to be made here. So I, I hope our questions address that well in our interviews. Right. Okay. Um, let's see, Mr. Johnson, from a process standpoint, before I take a motion and a vote, do we need to take additional comment or are we covered on that? And can the commission move forward at this point? I believe you can make a motion and uh, Mr. Trollop or Shalise, if I miss anything, let me know. But I believe even if you're ready to make a motion, you can go forward with that. Can I, can I just interrupt uh, Chair Morris for just one moment? So a little bit of confusion for me is we we're saying that one district has three people, or at least two people said that, but that we, and then we had two sort of at large and that that adds up to 12. Well, that adds up to 13. So I don't, I just wanna make sure we, we only got two in each district. No, so uh, that's a good clarification. So as I read this list there, and we could probably color those pink ones yellow to, to avoid some confusion. Um, so what I'm reading is there are three candidates from District 1, two from District 2, two from District 3, three from District 4, and two from District 5. So there's a minimum of two giving us a choice in each of the districts. And in some cases, there's a third. Um, and, you know, any of those not chosen for their district seat, plus the uh, others would be considered then in the at large. So, so do we have 12 or do we have 13? That's- I have 12. That's where I'm confused. No, I've got 13. Do you? I count 13, but- Well, uh, if we I, have three and one, two, and three, I have three, three that would be 13. Two, two, three, two. The districts two, three, and five only have two names selected each. Correct. Districts one and four have three. So that would give me 12. Huh? That's so what I count. Let me, let me read them. Let me read them to make sure that my list and your list are the same. Great. At the moment, I show that we are considering in district one, Claudia Knudsen, Daniel Montello, and Karen Twible. Right. In District 2, it would be Ken Masuda and Megan Turley. In District 3, it would be James Hudley and Benjamin Olmedo. Right. In District 4, it would be Jennifer Hardin, Lata Murti, and Amanda Ochoa. And in District 5, Kevin Illac and Janet Rios. My mistake, I counted a last name as a first name. So, 12. Absolutely. Mr. Okay, Churchill, does that add up now for you? 
It does. I think we're All right. good to go. Uh, so at this point, if somebody wants to make a motion, we could then um, decide, you know, we could decide or learn whether we have at least three votes to move this pool forward uh, for interviews. I so move that we accept these 12 people for the interview next week. I have a motion by Commissioner Gray. Do I have a second? I a second. second. I have a I'll take uh, the second from Commissioner Katz. Uh, Ms. Tilton, can you call a roll? District 1, Commissioner Katz. Aye. District 2, Commissioner McClintock. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Bradley. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Gray. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Morris. Aye. Passes 5-0. All right. So the next item on our agenda, number six, is um, discussion, deliberation, and action regarding the interview process and interview questions. Um, before, well, let, let me let, let's let's open this up for some public comment. Um, again, this would be comments specific to recommendations around the process of the interview and potential questions that folks think we should ask. Um, Ms. Tilton, do we have any requests to speak? Uh, yes, Lee Heller. Ms. Heller. Chair and commissioners, thank you. Uh, again, I will try to be brief. Um, I Obviously, you're going to ask the same questions of every candidate for the interests of equity in the process. Um, and I'm thinking you should probably create an ad hoc committee um, as you did before to set up proposed interview questions for the rest of you to review. I, I think your interviews are next week, so you probably don't have a lot of time. And I'm really mindful of that. And I don't know how much you're allowed to do in electronic format as opposed to in the group. But if you could have a few people sit down and come up with the interview standards and then circulate them for review by the full body, I think that probably would be more efficient after input right now. Um, and I think I would be looking for um, comfort and competency in the assessment of data, not necessarily just in the field of geography, although that doesn't hurt. Um, independence of thought, and that doesn't mean whether or not someone has party preference, but whether or not they're too tied to particular policy issues as their agenda in wanting to be on the commission. So those are a couple of things that leap to mind for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Heller. Any other requests? I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, well, we'll close public comment and bring Oh, I'm up. sorry, I'm sorry, I missed a- uh, Nick and under the- Jonathan Abdu, uh, I'm sorry, Aboud. Yeah, nope. Aboud. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Aboud. Jonathan, are you there? I think we can see you, but we're not hearing your audio at this moment. Um, oh, I apologize. It will, it will, is there anybody else that's asked to speak? Janet Blevins. Good evening, Ms. Blevins. Thank you. Um, I wanted to compliment you on the work you have accomplished today. I think we're in good hands and I appreciate all the time and thought that, that you've put in and taking other people's comments into account right here, right now. I think that's great. Good work, thank you so much. Thank you. Can we try Jonathan one more time and see if his audio is working? Okay, does it work now? Yes. yes sir. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I won't repeat all of my comments, but I'll say that first, thank you for having this hearing today and being such a great commission so far. My name is Jonathan Naboot. I'm a board member for the Santa Barbara Community College District. And my only input at this point would be that there is public comment after the interviews have taken place so that the public can comment on the content of the interviews and anything that's said, maybe red flags are raised. So it's my only comment. Thank you for taking the time to hear us. Appreciate it. Very well, thank you. Any other speakers? 
I don't see any other hands raised. Let's give it a minute here. I don't see other any other hands raised. Very well. We'll close the public comment on this item and bring it back. Um, Mr. Johnson, let me let me start with you for a moment and ask. Uh, so around this issue of raising of, of writing questions, the the one commenter was correct. Our time frame is short. <laughs> Uh, if, if we're going to include the, the questions in the agenda packet, which I presume we should, um, and make them known to the candidates before they show up. Um, do you have, or would you, could you provide maybe a starter set based on other, you know, similar processes or any, any help there to get us started? Not, not, a, not like I'm looking for it right at the moment, but. Right, right. Um, the challenge is, is that with interviews on uh, the 8th, um, the agenda packet needs to be posted um, Friday. So the day after tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, the, Ms. Heller was correct. There's very little time. Um, I'm not. Part of the challenge of being a groundbreaking uh, first in the state independent county commission is that <laughs> there aren't any questions. No. Um, most of the local government commissions that exist at the city level already are purely done on applications. They don't have an interview stage. So there really aren't a set that some other commission has gone through, unfortunately. Okay. Let me ask this question. Let me start with a process question for the commissioners. How much time do you wish to give to each of the candidates? Remember, we're doing 12. How, what's an appropriate, Commissioner Katz, what's a? No, no, no. That was an errant hand. <laughs> All right. Away. Anybody have a start? I, you know, is, is Commissioner McClintock. I'll just throw out that, uh, you know, imagine we all have one question. So five questions to ask. Um, we give them three minutes to answer each of those questions. That's 15 minutes, right? 15 minutes per candidate. That's just a ballpark idea. Okay. Um, so about three hours worth of plus or minus with some transition time. Let me, Gray, yes. let, me, let me clarify too. I'm going back between uh, muting and everything. Um, I, I, that was my suggestion was each of us ask the same question to each of the candidates, um, allow them some time. After each candidate has answered our five questions, do we then open it up to public comments or do we do it after we've interviewed all the people? I just want, I, what's the process here? We open it up for co public comments from the public based upon what the candidates have said to us, do we do it after each candidate? Or the then end. we go to public comments or do we wait until we've interviewed, you know, six, one night, and then we yep. have comments? What's the great, process? Great question. Commissioner Bradley, I don't have your um, process document right in front of me. I'm hoping that either you or Commissioner Katz, did you address that in your recommendation? No, not directly, okay. but I would point out that, um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, getting to move first in chess. Uh, I would say that we ought to have all the questions come after all of the interviews. Otherwise, what can happen is a bit of confirmation bias enters in where, you know, the people who go last listen to what people are responding to and play to that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think just as a safeguard against that, we should hold all questions from our comments from the public until the very end. Very good. Mr. Katz. I agree with that. And I also have a, a process or procedural question. Are we, I thought we didn't want to publicize our questions because we didn't want sort of people ahead of time to be able to prepare their answers. Am I? Um, so I, Mr. Johnson, is there a, 
I was just going to comment on that. Given that some of the interviews will be the first night and some will be the second night, right. it's probably better to publicize them just so that the second night folks don't have the advantage of hearing. Okay. Or, or even the commission, Commissioner Bradley's point, the latter ones on the first, you know. Right. Um, okay. Got it. Yeah, I, I do think that how, um, and I also wanted to clarify, I remember in one of our earlier sessions, there was some public comment around allowing the public to question the candidates. Mm -hmm. And I think we've agreed that, that that's not appropriate, that mm -hmm. we will do the, 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 the querying and they can then provide commentary. Is that, are we all on the same page with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. I, I still have some concerns I expressed from last time about that I don't know why we have to do everything the eighth and ninth and have the decision because now now we're in a manageable number of maybe six and six or nine and three because we want to decide at some point. But now we have the situation where we need five magic questions and it's like it's too late to try to do something in the next week or so before the eighth. Should we have another meeting next week to come up with the questions and then try to orchestrate? Are we going? I think if we do six interviews one day and six interviews the next day, and then we at night, then we have all the public discussions. I don't think we're going to be able to decide on the second night. Commissioners, who want can you hear me? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I've put some things in the chat and I don't know if you can read them, but the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women have put on forums and more forums and more forums. We have considered all of these questioning um, protocols and procedures and how to contact and let the candidates know so that they're all on the same page and how to, and it's going to take some, if you want it to be public, it's gonna take some special Zoom masters who really know what they're doing. Um, anyway, I am very serious about all of that because all of these um, things you've been considering are so important and it's work that these two organizations have done for many, many, many years. Very well, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Blevins. Uh, so Commissioner Gray, my only, my only concern is if we push this, is just scheduling. And, and you know, I know looking at my calendar as we start to get into that third week of December, um, evenings become challenging. Can't, not saying it can't be done, but, um, and, and I'm, my calendar may be lighter than some of the candidates, for instance. So, I just bring it up for discussion to make sure we're all on. Any, any any reaction to the to that, folks? Commissioner Bradley, I kind of I'd like to second uh, Commissioner McClintock's suggestion that we do a, a limited time frame, uh, five questions with a three minute response uh, will keep us on a, a good time frame to get done. If we do a six and six, um, I think we can get that finished. Uh, we will of course have public comments, and that we'll have to also limit the time on that if we're not going to be up all night doing that. So we'll have right. to, uh, that's yet to be determined. We'll have to figure out how long we want to go for public comments. But I think as long as we tick, stick to our time frame, uh, we can get it done in two meetings uh, before we hit that troublesome third week of this month when it's going to be very difficult to gather people together. Right. Thank you. Commissioner Katz. I'm just recalling in our um, meeting on the 18th that we thought about having fewer on the second night as opposed to the first night. So, and I think that was your suggestion, um, Commissioner Morris. Yeah, and, and only because I would want to make sure we have that we reserve time on the end of that second evening for deliberation, right? And, and, and right. Um, right. So, so maybe it's an eight and four or seven and five. I don't know that there's a magic there. Mr. McClintock, did you have a... Uh, just a quick comment, just returning to the uh, earlier um, comments and discussion around uh, public asking questions rather than uh, the commissioners asking questions. I'd just like to highlight that it is possible for members of the public to submit ideas to us for questions we might ask. So uh, 
we'll have time to, to get, I just wanna make sure we'll have time to get ideas from the public for the kinds of questions we might ask. Yeah, and, and, and that's the rub, right, is, is <clears throat> how much time do we have to, to craft these? Right, um, right. Uh, Mr. Churchwell or maybe Mr. Johnson, let me just, let me just clarify on a process. Uh, recognizing that the agenda has to be out on Friday, um, could, we, could we publish the agenda with, and add the questions, say, on Monday? Could, could we buy ourselves a little more time, or does that, um, does that create a problem for us? Um, There's nothing in the Brown Act that would require you to publish the questions at all. So if you want to, you're doing it voluntarily, so you could do it after the agenda is published. That gives me a little more comfort um, with, with sticking with the schedule. <laughs> um, it buys us a weekend, Commissioner Bradley. You're oh, still you're muted. Better. Apologies. Uh, I said the only problem with that process is that the first set of six or eight uh, candidates are going to get the <laughs> they're going to get the questions cold turkey as a, as a surprise question, and then the second set of people are going to know what the questions are. Well, and, and that's why I think we would have to hit Monday, right? Yes. So this is yes. At least twenty four hours for the first set of folks, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So and so. Could, could it be emailed to them when they're, you know, could the questions be emailed to them when we're notifying what night they're going to be on and perhaps what time? Uh, well, oh. certainly they'll be told in advance. I, I think we need to move forward with the scheduling more expeditiously. Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to be reaching out to them and letting them know and scheduling them tomorrow. <laughs> so we don't have questions yet. I, I would just remind the commission too, um, at a past meeting we did asked the public to submit questions and we didn't get any in. Obviously we have more people and much more participation tonight than we did that meeting. But I think um, it's more likely, hopefully people will send in their thoughts about the people you've selected pro and con rather than uh, the likelihood that you'll get questions from the public. Right. So what I think I'm hearing is, is a recommendation that we, that we do five questions, one from each commissioner. Uh, that the questions are the same for all candidates, um, that, that we limit the response time to three minutes per uh, question, so uh, around 15 minutes per candidate. Um, we all kind of in, in, on the same page process-wise for the, up to that point? Let me, let me uh, I'm looking at chat from, from, from Janet Blevins, again, suggesting that they've done forums and they've had these kinds of um, questions. She's uh, recommending, I think it's the uh, American University Women and also the League of, of Women Voters. They may have some questions that could really help us. And, and hopefully they will submit those tomorrow so that the- Right, yeah. Hopefully Janet's listening and she can help us with some suggestions, yes. Absolutely. And we also had a we also had a speaker, I think, in the past from the league, didn't we? We had one of the nights. Yes. Okay. So maybe maybe there's a chance for us to reach out and remind them that we're looking for questions. Absolutely. Uh, anybody want to volunteer to help craft the, the magic question set? I'll I'll help out. I'll I'll try to reach uh the university women and maybe league just get with them in the next day or so and see if they can suggest some questions for us. How we would disseminate those around properly, Doug, how would we do that? If we get a bunch, do they need to send the questions to you directly rather than to us? Yes, that's certainly preferable to send it into the, okay. um, to the county has the uh, email address. Um, okay. For everything and so if it, everything goes through there it gets posted and all that normally yeah I, I okay see. and janet's con janet's confirming right now in chat that she'll let both organizations know and that we can work the logistics problems okay so that's the key janet contact i guess doug right perfect uh, 
Thank you. We need to use the email that, that they use to submit public comments. Right, with the question, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Janet. That way it becomes part of the record. Um, and just to emphasize, it really does need to come in tomorrow, <laughs> right. um, unfortunately. Because I think this little subcommittee we're working with has got to wrap up their um, list of questions. Um, right away, right. You know, by the end of the weekend. However, you want to define that, <laughs> because we want to publish them on Monday. Right. Hopefully, we'll have ten different questions, and each of us can decide which ones we want to ask. Does, Commissioner Gray, are you volunteering to help um, narrow down the question set? I will do. I, if nominated, I would outrun. If elected, I would serve. Yes. You're nominated. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, Thank you. A second commissioner who wants to help him. I, I'm so booked right now i'm recovering from knee surgery i got plenty of time <laughs> okay. I, I i will assist mr mcclintock very well um, so i think we've got a little subcommittee here of uh, commissioner mcclintock and commissioner gray um, we should do a roll call vote yeah and mr church well, I, I think um, the motion probably not only needs to uh, appoint those two, but it needs to acknowledge that we're going to take their work uh, as submitted because we're not going to meet again before we use the questions. Is that? Is that? I think that's that's the way I would do it. God. Yes. So just to be clear, the all everyone on the all the commissioners will be submitting to Commissioner Gray and I their preferred questions, and we'll be. A, 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 Putting those together with those that have been come through public comment or other ideas that we have received, we'll select from those questions and make the recommendation to the committee. Or to uh, the committee. So I think because we're not meeting again, you'll actually mm -hmm. select the five questions that we will use. So, <laughs> Commissioner Katz. So, I, a point of clarification. Um, uh, Commissioner McClintock, were you suggesting that we need to submit our questions to you, or were you going to be developing questions? Uh, my recommendation is that you, you submit questions to us and maybe submit, you can mul submit multiple questions, but maybe just list them in order of preference. Right. So, so if you have a question you want to be considered, Submit it through the to, to the county, and they'll share that with the subcommittee, along with any others that the public um, submits. And, and again, want to reiterate as Mr. Johnson's pointed out tomorrow <laughs> uh, for for those. And then Commissioner Gray and Commissioner McClintock will collaborate and and choose the five questions that we will use on Tuesday and Wednesday evenings. And let me just suggest for the questions that you're submitting, why don't you submit those straight to Ms. Tilton? We don't want emails going from one commissioner to another. Um, so if each of you can send it to Ms. Tilton, she'll put those together with, uh, she or I will put those together with what comes in through the public email address. And get Perfect. Hello. Well. Okay, so I think we have a recommendation. Can I get somebody to um, let's 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 do this somewhat formally? Is there a motion to approve that, Mr. Bradley? Yes, I wish to I wish to motion that we have a ad hoc committee consisting of Commissioners Gray and McClintock to take questions from the other commission members and from members of the public. League of Women Voters, AUW, and et al., and uh, formulate a final list of five questions that we will all submit to all of our interviewees. Is there a second? I second. second. I have a second from Commissioner Katz. Ms. Tilton, could we do a roll call? District 1, Commissioner Katz. Aye. District 2, Commissioner McClintock. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Bradley. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Gray. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Morris. Aye. Okay, so we've, we've got that, mm -hmm. we've got the questions down. Um, I think we know the time frame for the candidate interviews. Uh, 
Let, let's see, is there an agreement around how many we want to do each of the evenings? Do you want to do six and six, eight and four? I, I would do eight and four if we're going to try to decide on the ninth. Okay. Yep, that's fine with me. Agreed. Okay. Um, and, and then that, that kind of leads us, it, it will merge with item seven here because which is the public comment process. Um, do, are we, you know, there had been a request that we consider extending the three minute limit on public comments. We've had some discussion about holding all of the public comments to the end. Do we do that each evening or do we do it at the end of all 12 candidates? What's your preference on how we engage the pub, allow the public to comment on the candidates before we make a final decision? Commissioner McClintock. It seems to me that the, the the fairest thing to do is to hold off on public comment until the end of the second evening. Okay. So one public comment at the end of all 12 interviews. Correct. Okay. okay. Anybody have a so the so the first night we do eight, but no public comments until the next night, and we only have four people public comments, and then we'll have to decide on the ninth. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Now you'll have to allow public comment before the interview. Before general comments, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think just on that point, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was wondering about that. I, I you have to put it on the agenda to allow public comment, but you can ask people to hold their comments. You can't you can't require them to, but you can ask them to hold their comments till after right. the interviews. Right. At the after we've done the interviews, you're talking about. Mr. Johnson, correct. Hold off, okay. And then, how are we going to pick the eight? Just are we going to go down? Or are we going to the no, first I, eight from that list of twelve? My recommendation would be that that's a process Mr. Johnson's team would manage, and it would be, you know, based on people's availability. I I don't know that okay. I want to. Hey. A, okay, that makes sense. One night or the other, Mr. McClintock, will you? If there's a way to randomize their their appearance, that would be ideal. But uh, yeah, we obviously have to work around their schedules. Yeah. Um, good luck, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> uh, what about the time limit on the on the public comments piece? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I do see, you know, three minutes to talk about twelve people may not be um, a lot of time. Uh, on, the, on the other end, I think you got to have some limit and. Um, you know, I, and, and, and I'm, you know, I, I do have a little concern and, and there's no way around this one of, you know, people taking a, potentially taking a, 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 you know, a shot at a candidate after they've spoken and left and there's no way to respond to that. Um, I think that's up to the five of us to determine how valid some of those will be, but. But, uh, but basically if somebody has public comments, they have three minutes to talk about everybody not three minutes on each candidate that they have a problem with so that's that's the default that's correct the before the commission right now they have three minutes for any kind of comments that should be more than enough with 12 people yeah um while you're pondering that i probably should have opened for some public comment on since we kind of slipped into uh, um, item seven a, a little bit so um, Ms. Tilton, is there anybody in the public who'd like to make a comment around the public comment time frame? That's what we're discussing right now. Okay, we have Lee Heller. Ms. Heller. Sorry, it took me a minute to unmute. Um, I certainly don't want to take excessive time in public comment. You can see that I tend to try to be brief, but it is hard to imagine that I can fit all of my comments about 12 different interview candidates into three minutes. Um, you saw me rushing through my comments earlier when I was talking about the slates and who the preferred candidates might be and where some of the issues might lie. So I don't think there should be three minutes per candidate. That would be insane. You would be here into 2021, but I do think three minutes is cutting it a bit short. Maybe expand that to five minutes per speaker so that there's a little bit more time and hopefully the sensible speakers won't use all that time if they don't need it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other requests to comment on this item? We have Ken Huff. 
Mr. Huff. So I agree with, with Lee Heller um, that it would be too much to, to have so, so many minutes for every candidate. But I, I do think that maybe um, you could encourage people to keep it short. If there's a person or two people that they, they really want to speak about, do so. But um, you, I, I discourage you from having people go through all the candidates and say what they think about all of them, because we will be there all night. And I, I think all what you've talked about uh, just now, it makes a lot of good sense to me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Janet Blevins. Ms. Blevins. Hi. Um, I am a member of both of the organizations that I have suggested to um, this committee. And these are the kinds of logistical questions um, that we have been considering for decades. And so um, we really have, have procedures worked out that answer all of the wonderful questions that you've come up with. So um, I will do my best to get Lucy Toms Harrington in contact with who should it be? Uh, she should inter interface with the county staff through that email address that was posted a moment ago. I didn't see it. Redistricting at County of Santa Barbara. It's in the chat. Okay. Dot org. Yes. Okay. All right. And they'll share with us. Yeah, because it, it you know, it, it is well, well done and it works well. And then you guys can tweak whatever you want. It would be a lot easier that way. So the perfect 12 or dozen would be awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else, Ms. Tilton? I am not seeing any, any other hands raised. Okay. So we have a, so our default would be three. We have a recommendation of five. Mr. Johnson wants to add a little bit. I was just gonna add one thing for you to consider too, is that once you close public comment, it's closed, but the commission can still direct a question to someone in the audience. So if you want, and the reason I'm raising it now is we can ask the applicants to stick around for the discussion. I presume most will anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so that if if some comment was raised in the public comment period that you wanted to get a response to, you at your option can ask the applicant to respond to that claim. However, we might have eight one night and there's no comments until the second night unless we redirect the eight to may, be available the second night, right? That's why my question to the commission is, it, my thought is to, at your direction, to invite all of the 12 to, to at least listen in on your discussion of who you're picking so that they're available and we'll see them in the attendee list. Um, okay, that sounds good, yeah. But anybody have a preference on on the time frame on that? Do we have a three, a five? Somebody wanna be solemn and suggest four? <laughs> well, that was my idea. This is Commissioner Katz. Yep, thank you, ma'am. I'll second that. We said, uh, so I have a motion and a second to limit the public comment time to four minutes um, um, following the interviews of the candidates. Uh, Ms. Tilton. You're muted, there you go. Commissioner Katz. Aye. Commissioner McClintock? Aye. Commissioner Bradley? Yes, to four minutes. Commissioner Gray? Aye. And Commissioner Morris? Yes. Okay. Before we jump to item eight, uh, which is our confirmation of meeting dates and future agenda items, is there any other comments or business that the commissioners want to bring up 
related to the process that we're going to use next week. Have we covered it in good detail or is there anything missing? Yes. No, it's just, again, a question of clarification. Um, the, the public will submit comments through the redistricting um, um, email. And then we need to get our questions to the subcommittee through um, Ms. Tilton. Yes, By when? When? Um, Mr. Johnson? Preferably tomorrow, Friday at the very latest. Friday, uh, let's say Friday by noon, because then we'll send them out Friday afternoon. Um, however, we won't, we might not have the public input, for instance, from the, uh, um, I'm trying to remember her name, but from the uh, representative of the women of League of the Ms. League. Ms. Blevins, Ms. Blevins, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, I'm, I'm wondering why it couldn't be later on Friday. Because no one will be available to send them to the subcommittee uh, as part of it. Um, oh, and it's not just in NDC, it's county staff will go away too. Um, but, but we're not looking for the five of you to screen the public comments. Everything that comes from the public will go to the subcommittee plus whatever the five of you want to send to the subcommittee. So, so you're not, you don't have to review the public, decide what you like and just forward that to the subcommittee. Everything from the public will go to the subcommittee. Okay, so Friday by noon. And then Ms. Tilton will get to William and I the list that you have Friday morning, whatever you have, right? Thank you. Okay. Mr. Bradley. I'd just like to amplify uh, the commentary from Janet Blevins. I think the League of Women Voters is an outstanding uh, touchstone organization to work from. I think you're going to get some excellent guidelines from that organization. I know I've watched over the years, they've had many decades of battle-hardened public debates, and they've always been impartial and fair and uh, well well organized. So I would just say to our, our two sub uh, subcommittee commissioners, when in doubt, uh, perhaps defer to their guidelines. I think they'd be very helpful to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, item eight is a uh, discussion of meeting dates and future agenda items. Um, I think the only dates we have calendared at the moment are next Tuesday and Wednesday evenings. Um, is there a need, does anybody see a need to calendar a next meeting after that or can we do that when we're done with this process? It seems like before the 31st, we should have at least a meeting of 11 people. I don't, I, perhaps, I, I, I don't know that there's a requirement, but, but we certainly should. I, I, Mr. Johnson, anything that, that you all think would need to be agendized that would require us to gather before the first of the year? I don't think so. Um, I'm worried, as you know, meeting that those last two weeks of December is very hard to schedule and I'd hate to have nine of the 11 meet and two feel left out or, or miss out on that. Um, and I think, I'm not recalling the exact language, but I think there's something about in the language, I could be wrong about this, but that they get, that they take office January 1st too. Um, oh, okay. Okay. So, and, and the county needs to get them sworn in and all that. So that will okay. be good work. So maybe best. So I would suggest that, um, we set a date in January, um, you know, or at least you provide your availabilities in January uh, after the meeting on the, whatever it is, uh, on the 9th. At the end of that meeting, you give us your availability in, in early January, and then we'll uh, get a meeting scheduled with all 11. Um, uh, yeah, maybe, so let, let's, let's maybe put that on the agenda for the 9th. Uh -huh. um, and, and Mr. Johnson, what I may, what, what I might ask is, 
you know, if, if you could maybe give us at that point some guidance around what you think the appropriate cadence of meetings would be for, you know, let's say the first quarter, right? Because up until we get, you know, in April, when you get a data dump, um, there'll be limited amount of work that we can do. There's, we have to either determine whether we're replacing or confirming you and Mr. Churchwell, I suppose, but, but there's not, uh, I'm guessing, not a lot of um, time sensitive items that we will need to address before April. There, there may be some um, as we get into that, and maybe we could talk about when do we begin holding the public outreach meetings and some of that kind of stuff. So if you could come prepared to give us some guidance around maybe a recommended cadence for the first say half of the year, um, that might help us to, because I, 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 at least for myself, I'd like to get the dates on as many of them as we can, as far out as we can, mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with some um, optimistic hope that the economy will reopen again and we'll get back to doing other things. Um, so to any guidance you can share in that would be helpful. Isn't there something that's going to be released, planned to be released late January, that's some preliminary? Did yeah. I read that someplace? No. Um, in in February, we'll get the American community, we're supposed to get the American community survey data, but that okay. won't have any total population data. That's more the, okay. you know, white collar, blue collar, citizen voting age data, that kind of stuff. The total population, okay. which we don't know about. And fingers crossed, we'll get it in April. All right, thank you. Could I propose that maybe this would be uh, before we get an information dump that we start thinking about some kind of orientation to this process? Excellent suggestion. Okay. Yep. Yes, and, and the cadence the chair is talking about in, in my mind and Ms. Tilton's mind is it'll be a mix of public information, public engagement, and training sessions, definitely. So training. Good. And, and training for aimed at commissioners, but also for the everyone in the public that wants to uh, know what how to do this. Very well. Commissioners, anything else you'd like to put on our agenda for, um, so I, uh, the eighth, I think we're public comment, disclosures, minutes, and then eight interviews. On the ninth, it's the first three and four interviews and public comment and deliberation. Is there anything else that you all would like to add to those agendas? Feels like enough. <laughs> A break. Very well. Well, um, I think we covered some good ground. I actually kind of thought we'd be here a little longer than this. I thought we came to some consensus very well. Um, I think that reflects on everybody doing some advanced work. So well done. Um, and Mr. That. Chair, I would note um, uh, Nancy Anderson from the county just posted in the chat that she's already working on getting Spanish translation for future meetings. And sure enough, Zoom does have a kind of switch to the Spanish channel feature. So okay. that is already in the works. Great. Very well. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Appreciate that. Mr. Churchwell, any final advice, comments, or words of wisdom? Good job and have a good evening. <laughs> Douglas or Mr. Johnson? Yeah. Late. Sounds good. All right. Commissioners, anybody? If not, I think I'd take a motion to adjourn. Thanks very much. Commissioner McClintock, who made the motion. I think we're good. Second, go. Have a great evening, and, and uh, we'll see you all um, next week. Great. Thanks, everybody. All